Go ahead and start. Uh, uh, in my notes, it says good afternoon, but we still have one minute of morning, so good morning. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kamran Abedini. I'm the chair of industrial and manufacturing engineering uh, department at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, welcome to the 2020 Ganpat and Manju Patel College of Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. This event is possible due to two passionate supporters of the college, Ganpat, Pat Patel, and his wife Manju. The generosity of Pat and Manju allows us to continue the Distinguished Lecture Series and support our students today and in the years to come. Pat graduated from Cal Poly Pomona in 1970 with a degree in electrical engineering. In 2015, he was inducted into the College of Engineering Hall of Fame for his professional accomplishments and contributions to the field of uh, engineering. In 2019, Pat earned the Padma Shri award from the Republic of India, one of the most prestigious civilian honors conferred by the country. Uh, we also like to welcome Cal Poly Pomona's uh, provost, Dr. Sylvia Alva, for attending today. As a provost, she is responsible for the academic enterprise of the university. Please welcome Provost Alva to the podium as she shares her brief remarks. So thank you for the opportunity to welcome each and every one of you. And more importantly, I also want to expand and amplify what uh, Professor Abedini has already shared. We're here because of the generosity of two people who really understood what Cal Poly Pomona meant to them. Um, in particular, Pat Patel is a graduate of our institution and believed and benefited from the learn by doing tradition that is who we are and how we engage in our work. And so it's really my honor to simply uh, thank him, thank all of you for being here. We're grateful to have such a loyal and generous alum. And I'll share a personal story with you. Every time I see Pat Patel, 99% of the time, he's probably sporting very proudly the green jacket that he was given that the College of Engineering gives to their Hall of Fame honorees. So I really always am so glad to see him. I'm sorry he's not able to join us today, but I know he is here in spirit and we're grateful for his generosity and thank you all for being here today. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, before we begin the lecture, I want to mention that we're planning to conclude by about uh, 1250. Uh, if you need to leave for class, we ask out of courtesy, you wait until the conclusion of the lecture, if possible. We will allot about uh, approximately 10 minutes uh, for Q&A, and uh, a mic will be provided to you guys for any questions that you could have, and somebody will bring it to you. Uh, today, we invite two speakers who embody one of the college's core uh, values of being bold, of having grit, taking risk, and learning from challenges. Uh, they are the co-founders of Shark Wheel, Zach Fleischman, Chief Operating Officer, and David Patrick, Chief Technology Officer. Several months ago when I was contacted by them, as it was mentioned in a famous movie, a bit differently, they had me at, <laughs> we reinvented the wheel, <laughs> Plus, I became aware that uh, uh, they had pitched this invention successfully at, on Shark Tank and have been featured on the Discovery Channel. What could be more exciting at, uh, to a Cal Poly Pomona professor who continuously pitches the importance of creativity for making things better? This is what the industrial and manufacturing engineers do. Please join me and welcome Zach Fleischman and David Patrick. So uh, thank you, Cameron, and thank you for everybody coming today. We're very excited to be here and present. Um, I'm going to be presenting, I will be presenting the business portion, uh, which is the more boring portion. So I'll try to power through it fairly quickly and uh, leave you guys with David Patrick, the inventor who has all the fun stuff. Um, so basically, uh, Shark Wheel uh, is the reinvention of the wheel. It's the only wheel that sells in the world that's not circular. Um, 
and let's get right to it. So this is how we form the business of Shark Wheel. We, um, I met David Patrick through a mutual friend, and uh, David had made a massive scientific discovery. And I've been obsessed with cosmology and physics my whole life, so I met David as just a, uh, a curiosity to learn about his discovery that he had made. And what happened was we ended up getting picked up by the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, which was started by the mayor of LA. Um, and we just had an idea, really. It was just an idea that David had, and we, had, we patented the wheel. Um, but we didn't know if anybody would want it. We didn't know if it had performance advantages at the time. We just knew that it was a very interesting shape. So the best uh, thing that we had heard about at the time was launching a Kickstarter campaign. We had learned that through crowdfunding uh, a project with just an idea that people would be willing to wait um, and willing to essentially pay for the product up front to allow us to finish the R&D process. So what we did was launch a Kickstarter campaign uh, in, in June of 2013. The idea for the wheel was patented in 2012. So in June of 2013, we launched a Kickstarter campaign uh, for skateboarding because we knew it was a, a large consumer wheel market where we didn't have to sell the whole product. Like for example, it's impossible for us to sell stroller wheels. Nobody would buy wheels for just their stroller and then put it on. Uh, but for skateboarding, that is how it works. You can just buy wheels and that was a market where we could just focus on one product. Um, and we felt the Kickstarter campaign would tell us if the market's interested in what we had. So it's one thing that you know we like our product and it's another thing that the market tells us that. So we launched the Kickstarter uh, campaign. We only run a 30-day campaign, and we end up being overwhelmed at the response. So we asked for $10,000 to begin the tooling process, and we ended up with uh, just short of $80,000 at the end of 30 days, and we had over a million views to the campaign. The Discovery Channel called us, along with numerous other outlets. We're on the cover of yahoo.com, msn.com. Um, and Discovery Channel comes out and does a whole segment on David reinventing the wheel. Um, so it was, it was this firestorm of just an incredible uh, experience where, where it was just really an idea. We didn't even know how to make the wheel, and David will get to that later. But, um, but we, we were inundated with different industries contacting us, and the thing was we didn't even know how to make it. So we had all this media attention, and we, we, we didn't even have a product to sell. Uh, it wasn't until almost a year later in May of 2014 that we started fulfilling the orders on the Kickstarter. And that was its own process in and of itself. So David will get to the technical side and explain how the whole molding side worked and why it took so long for us to get there. Um, but I just wanted to run through this really quick. The last part on this slide is uh, we started as an LLC, which is common for most companies. Um, but as we were growing, we learned that um, if we switch to a C corporation, there's uh, an IRS code, it's called code 1202, and it allows you to start a five-year clock. And so that's what we did. We switched to a C corp, we started our five-year clock, and what that does is it allows a small business to eventually sell their company 100% 100 tax-free up to $50 million. So as we were growing the company, we realized that if we can grow this into what we hope to grow it into, this could save all of our investors, and we have uh, almost 1,500 investors, um, millions of dollars. So that was, that was something that we had learned al along the way in a business sense. And just really quick, just for uh, everyone's knowledge, I've never taken a business class in my entire life, ever. Um, I only went to one year of school at UCLA, and uh, I was a pro tennis player for 10 years on the ATP tour. So everything that I've learned in the business world has really been a crash course in business. Um, and we, we essentially started the idea of the company in 2012. And uh, I've had to learn how to become proficient in everything from, everything from investments to manufacturing to licensing, and the list goes on and on. Um, so jumping to the next slide here. Um, we are big fans, as I mentioned, of uh, crowdfunding. So we've done quite a few campaigns. We're actually running two campaigns concurrently right now. Uh, we launched an electric skateboarding campaign that has about a week left on it, and it has about $70,000. Um, we have the best value uh, electric skateboard in the entire industry. It goes almost 30 miles an hour and 
has about 30 miles of range. Um, and then uh, this, this original, the second one listed here, that was our original campaign where we raised just shy of $80,000. Um, the bottom one on the left is uh, when we started getting into other industries. So what happened was we ended up airing on Shark Tank, which David will talk about more later. And uh, through Shark Tank, uh, we were overwhelmed with how many different applications came to us. Uh, things from cent central pivot irrigation. We didn't even know what central pivot irrigation was. I'd never even heard of the term, but it's big in the farming world, which you'll learn about. Um, but one of the markets that came to us was luggage. And uh, we launched a campaign with a luggage company. Um, we, si we signed a, uh, a deal with them, and they own the licenses for Harley Davidson, Samsonite, and Sky Valet. Uh, so we are on all three of those luggages. And for Sky Valet, they launched a smart luggage Kickstarter campaign. And they raised $150,000. And there was two weeks left in the campaign. And instead of promoting the luggage and the wireless charger and the magnetic openings that they had, they, they hired a new marketing company and they switched the marketing 100% to Shark Wheel. And it closed in the last 14 days at 685,000. And it had so much momentum that it actually reached 950,000 a few weeks later uh, on an Indiegogo in demand project. Um, so it's raised just about a million dollars. Um, for our luggage that's out there now. Um, and then the other, the other thing, that, which might be the most interesting thing, um, is that we heard about the JOBS Act passing before Obama left office, which allowed equity crowdfunding. So it allowed the average any person in the world to invest in companies, uh, which was previously illegal. And um, so we took advantage of that. We were one of the earliest companies to get in on equity crowdfunding. And it's very difficult when you're starting a company to get a VC or an angel to invest in your product. But when you can launch with a click of a button online and get the average person to invest 200 bucks, it's much easier. Um, so we were able to, uh, to survive and thrive by raising on three equity crowdfunding campaigns, one of which is running right now. So anyone in this room could log on to sharkwell.com and actually invest in our company. Um, so that is one of the game-changing ways that uh, in the business world that people are now raising money, which we found. Um, and let's see here. I think that, is this your slide? Okay, that's all you. All right. So yeah, it, uh, I'll open it up to questions and answers. If any, or if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer it. And if not, I'll turn it over to David to get to the fun stuff. Okay, we saved the question. Do this one so I can keep it closer to my face. Pops off this way. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. All right, so thanks a lot for having us here. I really appreciate it. Zach's a great partner. That's one of the best things we have about our company is that it's a partnership. We got a great group of team members. One of them is Tom Lindahl, who's sitting here. Go ahead, stand up, Tom. Turn around and embarrass yourself. Thank you. Yep. He's a graduate of here. How about that? So Tom's a stellar guy. He's in charge of sales for us. We have another guy who's not here. His name's Pedro Valdez. Pedro is a two-time Oscar, two-time Emmy Award winning guy. He's the guy behind Iron Man, Batman, Spider-Man, Pirates of the Caribbean, Lone Ranger, Star Trek, all that stuff. He's a master mold maker. And when I talk about all the challenges we had in making the wheel, Pedro was a big, big, big part of uh, taking what was an idea and turning it into a real product. So. As Zach said, we were on Shark Tank. That was massive for the company because it gave us a ton of exposure. And a lot of people that had problems in other industries came to us and told us that we had solved massive problems that were in their industries and that we could do it. So first thing we went into was the skateboarding. And skateboarding was really obvious, as he said, because it was a place where we could sell just the wheels. And by the way, I got a crap load of these wheels here. So since I have this, stop looking at your phone, pass that down. It was a wheel that we could just sell to people. We didn't have to go to a manufacturer and ask them to put it on their product. We could just say, hey, here's a wheel. If you're a skateboarder, put this on your board and give it a try. And it took a standard bearing. And it was easy to sell it. So that's why that was our first market. Hold on, I got two more coming. I got one for every row. And if you guys will pass them around, it'll help everybody get a visual of what it is, because it is a perfect cube. 
everybody looks at it and goes, oh, it looks like a square wheel. It's an optical illusion. It's like, no, it's not an optical illusion. It is a perfect dead flat on six sides cube, but it's also a perfect circle. It's also a perfect hexagon. It's also a set of sine waves. It's all these different things. So skateboarding was the first one. Second one we went into was luggage. So Harley Davidson's new luggage, Samsonite, Sky Ballet. We have a wheel that swivels really well. It changes direction really well. These wheels that I'm passing around, they go over rocks. They transition from hard surfaces to soft surfaces. They move a lot like everything in nature. That's a big part of what made us successful was this is the, the shape of our wheel is the way a fish swims. It's the way a snake moves. It's the way you walk. You walk left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, not on a tightrope. You define a sine wave as you walk. And so we found out that that was the most efficient way to move something forward, and that's why the wheel has succeeded so much as it has. The agriculture, we make a massive wheel. This wheel is this big. It's a gigantic wheel, and in this industry, it doesn't dig a trench. As it's rotating and watering the crops, the wheel doesn't dig into the surface. It stays up top, just like a snake staying up on top of the surface. We stay on top of the surface. They came to us the day after Shark Tank aired. They were the two rich cowboys showed up at our door. And I know they were rich cowboys because they had cowboy hats on and suits. And they said, you just solved the biggest problem in central pivot irrigation. And we were like, OK, what's central pivot irrigation? And then they told us what the problem was and how we solved it. So that was fantastic. Now we're in industrial. So inside of warehouses, right now we're inside Coca-Cola, Walmart, Costco, CVS, Target. Um, they're big warehouse facilities. We're in a bunch of them. They, we have a wheel that their wheel is like a big giant steamroller. And every time they hit something, boom, it, it stops the machine. It knocks the load off. You have all kinds of problems. But most importantly is how long it lasts. Our wheel, as it rolls, it wicks the heat away. So it, it's like having radiators in the wheel. So it takes the heat or the friction off of the wheel. So in scientific testing, we've had results where we lasted 600% longer than a traditional wheel. So in that industry, that's a real big deal, not having your machine go down and being able to go over rocks and not damage your floors and not have your pallet of stuff fall off. The next thing is printing. This is a massive industry for us. Somebody came to us and said, hey, all the rollers that are in a printing machine where the material goes through the, the entire thing to print, all those rollers would benefit from having the shark wheel shape on them because it would self-center the material. Normally, when you have the material on a roller, it wants to lean one way and start going off. That's cool when that's on me. They can see me a lot better. I'm blind as a bat now. Um, but to retrofit all those rollers to become shark wheel shapes would be a nightmare. It would cost millions of dollars. These are machines that are just incredibly expensive. Well, this guy said, what you do is you make a tape, and this is the tape, and it's got the shark wheel shape on it in the form of a silicone raised thing. Like if you put your finger across this, you'll be able to feel the shape of the wheel. So that tape wraps around the cylinder and turns the cylinder into a shark wheel. That costs a dollar. So I can retrofit any cylinder into becoming a shark wheel shape for one buck. And that was a game changer. So now going into that industry, and again, they approached us. A guy in Sweden called us up and was like, I got the greatest idea in the world. And we're like, OK, yeah, well, here we go again. And he said, make it as a tape, put it on a roller. So now any roller conveyance, right now printing's where we're starting. But any manufacturing where you have a belt moving on a, a wheel, we belong on that wheel. And so we're going to sell our product into that entire industry. So we've just got a bazillion different industries that we can go into. And they're all based on the exact same thing. How did it come about? So that's my favorite question. It's like it's, it opens such a can of worms for us. So as Zach said, I'm, first of all, like him, I did a little bit of college. I did not graduate. I don't want you guys to hold that against me. But I had a love of mechanical engineering and all that kind of stuff. I was becoming a draftsman, so I have the best block lettering you've ever seen. Um, it was something that I always liked. My father is an aeronautical engineer. He's involved in US Space Station and the Patriot missiles, all that stuff. And I was always fascinated with mechanical stuff. And one day, I was just driving my car up the freeway, and something hit me. And it was a big thing. I made a massive scientific discovery, which we have not released yet. We're going to try and release it in 2020. I'm going to talk to you about the school, about releasing it through this school. And this is going to be world-shattering stuff. This is a big deal that we've got. 
Um, this is the wheel inside of a cube. If you look at this little chrome shapey thing, that's it inside of a cube. It is a perfect cube. This, I have a play button on this if I want to, but this is a path on the outside of a sphere. We invented a spherical centrifuge, a centrifuge that doesn't spin like a regular centrifuge. It spins like a sphere, and the forces inside of it are ballooning out in all directions. That's kind of where it began. But we took this shape and we turned it into a turbine, we turned it into a centrifuge, we turned it into a wheel, but it was all the exact same shape. And the reason it kept working was it was correct from the beginning. It was based on nature, it had a real, it was the fundamental core thing. And once we had figured out that that was the core thing, how we were gonna monetize it, the dominoes just fell. It was, it's the coolest thing to have this company. I used to be in software and mortgage banking, like before this. So to have something like this, which is the gift that keeps on giving, and have a world-class team of guys behind you, I'm having the, I, the last 10, 15 years have just been incredible. I'm having the best time of my life. And, and we got better to come. So the wheel came about from the original design or the original discovery, which we, I'm not going to be cryptic with you guys, but you're going to see it. It's going to be a global thing when it hits. We've got something massive. And it's because we have this amazing team that we've been able to put it all together and be able to launch it to the public. And again, I want to push it through your school. So... Your dean's back there. I already told him we got a monster, and I'm going to work my way up and start showing you guys, and you're going to see it. Um, story behind the engineering. This is where Pedro gets involved, and this is where you guys are directly you know, associated with this. This is what we're doing here. 3D printing is the coolest thing that ever happened to manufacturing. Okay, Back in the day, if you wanted to go to somebody and say, okay, I want to make a cube that's one foot by one foot by one foot, and you go to a machinist and say, you got two choices. Either make me a cube that's one foot by one foot by one foot, or in the space of that cube, an exact replica of the Taj Mahal. Which one would be easier? They would say the cube every single time. To a 3D printer, it's cheaper and faster to print the Taj Mahal than it is to make the cube. The cube takes more time and more effort for the 3D printer to make than the Taj Mahal. It doesn't care about complexity. It doesn't care about any of that stuff. It's just going to sit there and lay down filament, okay? That changed the game because now when you were thinking of a design, you weren't straddled with, okay, how am I going to manufacture this? How am I going to get this to be manufactured on a big CNC machine? Which, again, is a big deal, but you got metal printers now. you got all kinds of things. Well, with Pedro, we first started out 3D printing wheels. And we would 3D print a wheel, and he would make a silicone mold and start popping out copies of it, and we would try them out and prototype. And then we got smart, and we were like, instead of 3D printing the wheel, let's 3D print the mold to make the wheel. And then we would make copies of this. So we would 3D print this little part out. He would make a silicone mold of it and start popping out copies of it in an aluminum epoxy resin, and by God, I'd be in production. And what used to take months and $30,000 per design became four or five days and $400. So I could come up with a new design for 400 bucks. And that's like a game changer. It was like anything we could think of. And instead of designing it to where it was the least amount of steps to get to this design in a, you know, by a traditional manufacturing process, we were inventing handholds in it, engraving our names in it, you know, doing all kinds of fun things that made it possible to really expand what we were doing. So that's one of the key things I want to stress today is we're at the forefront of what's called rapid development, you know, that ability to go from idea to final product. 3D printing, all of the processes that you see out there today, they have just changed the game. You guys are like coming in when it's super cool. It used to be, you know, blueprints and so much effort to try and figure out how to machine something. And now it's just flick a button and you're in. And hopefully everybody here is proficient in CAD, and if you're not, get proficient in it, because that's where your ability to take your idea and make it real is where you're going to be. All right, I'm going to go one more slide. I think this is my last slide. Let me make sure. Yep. So this last slide, and this is because I want to spend a lot of time with you guys asking questions, because I think that's way more important. I can't just sit here and vomit information at you. You guys are going to want specific stuff. The scientific advantages... I already said we make less friction than a regular wheel. So when you look at our wheel and it's rolling, it's only the tips are touching. So you have less surface area hitting the ground, but it's got 
the grip of a much bigger wheel. So it's like a fat tire and a skinny tire put together. If you want grip, you get a fat tire. If you want rolling resistance, you get a skinny tire. Well, I'm a skinny tire and a fat tire depending on what I'm doing. If I'm on the highway on a hard surface, I roll like a skinny tire. But if I'm in the sand or the mud or the dirt, I grip like a really fat tire. So I've got the best of both worlds, and that's where the scientific advantages came out. So as far as you know, off-road capabilities and things like that, when you hit a speed bump with your car, if you hit it dead straight, you feel a big shock. But if you take it at an angle, you're increasing the distance over the bump, and it lessens the shock. Every single thing this hits, it hits at an angle instead of straight on. And that's a big advantage. So the shock to the operator, the shock to the machine, the shock to the load, everything is lessened because you're always hitting everything at an angle. So friction in that, and then the last part is the ability to swivel or change directions. A regular wheel, if you push it forward and then try and go 90 degrees of that, it'll scrub. Ours won't scrub, it'll change directions right away. So it's a, a beautifully swiveling thing, easy to change directions, stuff like that. That's why we exist on luggage and things like that. So we took all these scientific advantages and we turned them into three basic products. One was friction drive, where I'm taking something and I'm reducing the amount of friction. The other one was casters, which go on every single kind of piece of equipment that you can name. And then the other ones are the tapes and that kind of stuff, where we're just taking the idea and finding some way to get it on as many products as we can as cheaply as possible. Okay, so that's all the boring stuff from me. I'd like to hear from you guys now. How much time do we got? We got like a ton of time, don't we? we do. Good. So he's got the mic. So if anybody's got a question, we're going to hand the mic to that person. You guys are going to ask it, and then I'm going to try and answer it. Who's got the first question? And somebody better have a question. All right, him back there. Wait, wait, wait for the mic, because they got to be able to get you on camera for posterity's sake. So, uh, a big question I feel on everyone's minds is, when are we going to see this kind of technology on cars? Okay, so great question. When it comes to cars, you got to go through a lot of regulatory stuff. you got to go through Department of Transportation. you got to do this. you got to do that. You guys aren't old enough to know the story, but Ford got sued for like a zillion dollars because their Explorers were rolling over because of Firestone tires. That's a regular wheel, and they got sued for really, I would get annihilated but, you know, going out there with a square wheel. So... We're really cautious about which markets we're going to go into. Automotive, I have to be flat to the ground, okay? If I was on a bike and you lean, it would be horrifying. Bikes and inline skates, you're never going to see me on them. I have to be perpendicular to the ground. That's one of the key things. On a car, your tires tow in and tow out. You have camber, especially when you turn. Well, that's going to put me on that edge. So it's kind of an iffy one. When it comes to sand rails and things like that, they don't really do that, especially the rear tires. So I see us getting on ATVs and off-road vehicles and things like that. This actually started out as something for the military. This is a funny story. We, at LACI, which is Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, we were there for our turbine. And the turbine was a new kind of propeller that we invented using the same shape. They had told us, look, this belongs on the new Hummer. Because the new Hummer, when it's on the freeway, you want good mileage. You want something that's going to roll really nice rolling resistance. But then it's going to go off in the sand and the muck and the crap. And you want to be able to just dig your way out. And we're like, perfect. This is our thing. So he said, OK, we're going to set you up with this big general. You're going to meet with him from the Army. And this guy's a real big deal. And he's going to make this happen for you. Well, his name was General David Petraeus. OK, and those of you that laugh know Two weeks before we were supposed to meet with him, they found out he was sleeping with his biographer and telling her all the secrets of the universe. And so he got fired from the army. And we're like, OK, that one's out. And the funny thing was, we had designed this wheel to go on the new Hummer. And then when we were looking at it in the computer, small size on a little tiny screen, it looked like a skateboard wheel. And it was like, damn, let's try a skateboard wheel first, because I've been a skater my whole life. So it was like, OK, let's do that. So if we had gone with the army and the Hummer, it never would have become a skateboard wheel. We would never would have done the Kickstarter. We never would have done any of those things. So anyway, started out as something for a car, but then we found out better just to go for the low-hanging fruit. And that's the best advice I can give you on anything. You know, Go for where the easiest market to money is going to be. And for us, that was not automobiles. That's probably going to be the last one you'll ever see me on, but it may happen one day. Who knows? The idea for it is perfect. Making it just a tread design would be a good idea. 
So maybe we'll sell his tread stock. We're working with Cooper Tires right now. They have a division called Cooper Standard. And so we're working with Cooper Standard on materials and stuff like that. So who knows what's going to happen. Next. Give that man the mic. You guys better start thinking of questions. We got time. We got a whole nother 20 minutes of me standing up here. And I love this part. Uh, my main question was how does it go up like angles or like uphill? Does it work on that? Absolutely. So it, it, in that case, it's just like a regular tire. When you're talking about grip, when it's just forward and you start to slip, once you lose it, you're done. You're just clutching. You're just, you've got nothing else. But because it's a wave, it's acting like a really fat tire. And so it's just grabbing and grabbing. So it has tremendous grip because, and not only that, when you've got a regular tire and you start sliding in one direction, you end up on the edge, on the sidewall. I have three different sidewalls and they're all moving. So you end up transmitting from the outside one to the middle one to the inside one and all of them are trying to grab and get you up. Same thing is happening forward. Yes? Oh, good. One of the, one of the educators. Well, uh, if you had an opportunity to teach about creativity and uh, tell... I don't think that on? one's on. Is it? Yeah, it's on. Hello. There you go. All right. So if you had the opportunity of teaching about creativity, uh, what would you do? What would you say? How did you come up with this idea? Okay. So once again, you know, the biggest loaded question, how'd you come up with this idea? And it's, I always say, I saw the secrets of the universe first. Then I went and did this and this and this. Okay. So I was not... I didn't consider myself a creative person, okay? I considered myself more of an analytical, that type of a person. But I started doing what I loved. And if you're doing what you love, you're always going to succeed at it. So from a creative standpoint, the world used to always be a lot more difficult than it is right now. You didn't have the internet where you could go out there and find stuff really quick. You didn't have tools like CAD that allow you to go out there and do all these things three-dimensionally and then 3D printers which allow you to print them. So if I were teaching people about creativity, it would be about first being a subject that you're passionate about. If you're not passionate about it, it's odds are you ain't going to make it because you got to be able to, you know, it's got to be in your wheelhouse. So number one, be creative about things that you actually love or solve a problem. And that's another key thing. Creativity, everybody's got an idea. How many here have an idea? Raise your hands. Okay, it's freaking everybody, okay? It's worthless, okay, until you can do something with it. And that's the other side of creativity is being able to take it from idea to the end zone is a battle. It's an absolute, but we know how to fail. You want to see a company that knows how to fail, we know how to fail. We knew from the beginning, and I preach this constantly, you are never going to hit it out of the park on the first swing of the bat. It's just not going to happen. It is a process. You're going to do it, you're going to fail, and failure is an arrow pointing you away from that thing. And then you move to the next one and you fail, and you move to the next one and you fail, and you just keep going. You can't do that if you're not passionate about it. If you don't have a love for the thing that you're doing, the first obstacle you hit, boom, you're just going to fail and you're going to give up. Failure is the key to success. The absolute key to being a creative mind or being a successful creative person is learning how to fail. If you can't handle failure, learn because it's coming. And, and I'm the perfect example of that. Everybody looks at us and goes, God, you guys are so lucky. You have it so easy. And you got this world-class team of people. And it looks like everything just showed up on one day. And it's like... You have no idea. This is version 1473, you know? It's, this isn't version one. So understanding how to fail, understanding how to be passionate about your dream and follow your dream, that's what the, only, the advice I would give to people. And let me tell you something. I am the happiest guy you've ever met. I love what I'm doing. I love making a product that people like. I love being the guy that's got the square wheel. And I'm real easy to make fun of. But by God, I got the goods, you know? And that's just the same thing with the scientific discovery. It's like, I'm easy to make fun of. Guy with a square wheel solves the secrets of the universe. It's like, bring it on, baby. That's, that's what I did, you know? And we're having a, a wonderful, wonderful time with it. And I wish all of you that same success where it's like, find your thing. Because I had no business doing this. I was not educated in this. I had no reason to be able to do this. But... I just was passionate about it, and it, creativity came with it. I learned creativity from other people, you know, being around really great people. And that's the other biggest part of it is 
all by myself, none of this would ever happen. None of it. I'd still be sitting in my room trying to draw a picture of a square wheel. But by joining up with other people that were different talents than me and that kind of stuff, that's how we all did it. It's always a team. So did you have the problem in mind first or something came to you? Okay, so <laughs> did I have the problem in mind or did it just come to me? I was driving my, I, I had been in mortgage banking for a long time, okay? I had a really big firm in, here in Southern California. I had 130 LOs and, you know, 30 staff. So I had 160 people working for me and I'm making tons of money. And then I sold it off and I went into software for that industry. And then I'm doing software and I'm driving my Lamborghini. I had tons of money at the time, I invested it all back into this. I was driving my car up the 405 freeway and all of a sudden something hit me, something simple. And it was like, holy crap, I'm right, you know? And it was something big. And that one little tiny seed, which was 12, 15 years ago to get to where we are today, but it was that little tiny seed of, I've got an idea. I didn't know if it solved a problem. I didn't know if it was something I could turn into a product. I had no idea what I was gonna do with it. I just knew I had a simple beginning. And from the beginning, I kept working it and working it, and, and I went in 10,000 different directions. I didn't start with the wheel. You know, it started with, I think I can't even remember what the original starting was. I think it was the centrifuge, but I'm not really sure. But it was this process of, how about this? Nope, how about this? Nope, and then eventually it got to that. The problems presented themselves to us. We did not know what the problems were out there. We gave the initial thing out there to the world, and then the world came to us and said, you just solved this problem, you just solved this problem. And then it was like, okay, that's cool that you believe that, but how do I make the thing that you now need? That was the next part of the process. So didn't have the problem first, I just had the original spark of an idea of, I've got something simple. And that's, by the way, when I talk about all the secrets of the universe crap, blah, 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 what I discovered was something simple. I hate complex crap, that's just not me. I could never be a physicist where you learn all these you know, amazing terms and da da That just wasn't my wheelhouse. I'm a simple guy, I like simple answers. And if the, the hardest thing in the world to do is come up with something simple. It's easy to come up with something complex. You can just keep adding crap to something and put wings on it and put Velcro on it and do this and do that. That's just complexity. I like simplicity and my centrifuge, my turbine, my wheel, they're all the exact same thing. I'm not smart. I'm just keep taking the same darn idea and regurgitating it again and again and again. So that's how I got to where I am. Started with something simple and then I went from there. And I may be completely different than everybody else where everybody else starts with a problem and then tries to find the solution. For me, I found a solution and then went looking for the problem. Okay, I was told to stand up to ask Woohoo! Uh, for the camera. So uh, two questions. Uh, the Swedish uh, and the tape, that's cool. Uh, what kind of percentage does he get? And second question, <laughs> any kind of gearing applications? Great questions. All right, so let's start with the Swede. His name's Ibra. He, it's six? He gets 6% of the idea. There you go. We had, we had to force him to take it. The dude didn't want nothing. He didn't want anything. He just wanted to be part of us. He just loved the shark wheel idea so much, and he just wanted to be part of our team. We flew him out here. I showed him the scientific discovery, and now he's like, I just want to be part of this team. That's all I want. And he constantly tells us, I don't care about money. I don't care about this. You know, Maybe he's independently wealthy. I don't know what it is. But he honestly doesn't care about the money. He never asked for anything. And to this day, the fact that we gave him 6% of the idea, we had to twist his damn arm. And we needed to do it. We were like, we got to pay you something because there's got to be a contract here. This is your idea. And yeah, it's my shape, but his idea of putting it on tape, there's no way I was going to let it go. I need to pay the man. And so whether it's him or his heirs or his wife or whoever's going to get it, somebody's going to get it. But he's got 6% of the idea. So the next thing is a gear. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. That's the one thing we haven't done. This would interlock with a counterpart so well. Regular gears are straight. I'm the wave. So there's a bunch of different ideas around that where it's a, uh, a wave and a wave where they're both, one's a negative, one's a positive, and the way they mesh together is flawlessly. The other one is the wave makes kind of a 
circle or a semicircle so you could have a peg in the middle. So it would be kind of like one of the wheels would have pegs sticking out of it, and the other one would have the shark wheel, and the shark wheel would grab the pegs and move it. So don't really know which way it will eventually end up, but that's somewhere in the future. And again, just like this tape, it's a wheel, it's a turbine, it's a centrifuge. We are drowning in opportunities, drowning in them. There's so many different avenues that we could go to. That was a challenge for the company because – Google comes to you and wants to do something. Callaway comes to us and wants to do something. These guys come to us and they're like massive companies and you're like, I can't do all of you at once. I gotta focus on this. So we try and pick four major categories a year and focus on those four. I think we're currently doing 13 or something like that. Like we have our project plan spreadsheet and there's a lot of them on there, but we really try and focus on what we know we patented this. That's another big part of our company is we're an IP company. So we filed patents on the tape, patents on the wheel, patents on the ag wheel, patents on the casters, patents on everything in the God's green earth so that we could partner with other people and let them do it. Somebody back there has shark wheels. Kick ass. Um, all right, so gear, good idea. Go ahead. Uh, so first of all, thank we'll you. We'll get to you. First of all, thank you for coming back here and uh, sharing your story and uh, for the future engineers and entrepreneurs. Uh, my question was, so I saw that you did a Kickstarter, like crowdfunding, and then I also saw that you did the Shark Tank, uh, Shark Tank show, obviously. So how important was that, um, how important was that, like, virality uh, fundraising? Because, you know, coming from, like, the financial, in financial industries, you could have easily gone through, like, the more traditional ways to fundraise. So could you speak on, like, how important that was to growing the product in your business? All right, hugely important. Because Kickstarter, first of all, they'll tell you whether your product is worth anything. Okay? If people aren't interested, they ain't going to buy it. Okay? Kickstarter not only gave us money to build the product, it gave us exposure to manufacturers, all kinds of things. People, other people that look at Kickstarter, they're not looking to just invest in something. They're looking to try and build the thing that the guy is trying to make. So it gave us exposure to all kinds of different people, whether it was marketing people or manufacturers or this or that. It all came through Kickstarter. So that was hugely important to us. As Zach mentioned earlier, crowdfunding this, no VC was going to give me, like right now we're crowdfunding and we're out there at $30 million valuation. Okay? So it's a $30 million company. We have all the potential in the world to be a billion dollar company. No VC would even rate me at a $2 million right now. They're just, they, they would destroy me, okay? Because it's kind of like hitting singles or hitting home runs. When you're asking one dude for a million bucks, he's got a million dollars worth of questions. But when you're asking somebody for a hundred dollars, they're just like, screw it. I'll give it a whirl, you know, I'll give it a try. So this thing opening up with crowdfunding, it's not, Kickstarter is pre-selling your product. You still have to deliver. Crowdfunding is invest in what you believe I am capable of at the number I say I set, okay? That has just been a game changer for us, a game changer, because we need money. I go into tooling for the uh, pallet jack stuff, 500,000 bucks. I got to come up with that up front, and then I got to pay for this stuff. The agriculture, we want a million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation. So that million dollars is paying for the ag wheel. If they hadn't given it to me, I'd have crowdfunded it. I'd have gone out there and got it that way. Who's got it now? Go. Hey, how's it going? Good, buddy. Um, got a question. Uh, how are you approaching scalability? Okay, so another great question. We do not, I do not want to become Acme Incorporated again. I had 160 employees and it sucked. Um, you have so many issues with personnel and this and other divisions and legal and all that kind of stuff, and I didn't want to do that. So for us to scale, it's by joint ventures. It's partnering with other companies. So on the Harley-Davidson luggage and Samsonite and that type of stuff, we partnered with a company called Athlon, and we go with them. When it comes to the pallet jack wheel, we're selling to Crown, we're selling to Heister Yale, we're selling to Toyota, which is Raymond. We're selling to all these different companies. So we went to the manufacturer to do it. You got a side question? Correct. Only the skateboard wheel do we manufacture right now. Okay, And that's not even true. I mean, we sub it out to somebody else. But we're a tight group of people, and I want to keep it a small, tight group of people. I want to be an IP company. So for me, scalability comes through joint ventures and partnerships with other big companies. And that's just how it is for us. I can't do it all by myself. We'd be stretched too thin. 
Okay, guys. So unfortunately, this is going, this is going to be the last question. So we got you in. And by the way, I'm available afterwards. So anybody's going to hang around. Just I'm an open book. Uh, he actually took my question about the manufacturing, but okay. I have a, a another one. Do you think who did my hair? <laughs> Me. <laughs> No. <laughs> um, do you think what you have right now can be improved further? No. Okay. And I'm dead serious. Okay, listen. It's the way that the wheel is shaped right now. I have never found another way to do it. There is one specific amplitude and frequency that makes it right. Anytime I've deviated off of that, problems every single time. It is as pure of a perfect central idea as I could find. So I don't believe I'm ever going to improve on the basic shape. I think the shape is done, and now it's apply. And so as weird as that sounds, I don't think I can improve it anymore. It, it is what it is. And that's because there's so much other evidence that shows it's already right. When you see the centrifuge, it has to be those six 90-degree turns. When you see the turbine, it has to be the six 90-degree turns. Everything in nature follows what I discovered. Everything, everything, from a seashell to a fruit to your body to atoms to galaxies, they all follow a very specific pattern. That pattern is a three-dimensional path, and that's what this is. So. I think it's as pure and perfect as it can be, and I don't want to pollute it. Is that it? Thanks, guys. I'm hanging around. Uh, all right. Uh, one second, please be seated. Uh, uh, we'd like to thank. Uh, shark wheel. Wait. Okay. Wait. wait Why is it happened? called a shark wheel? Sorry about that, buddy. That's okay. Go ahead. Where's the, Go ahead. Where's the little Go ahead. controller thing? Okay. I hated the name. Zach came up with it. And I hated it. I wanted it to be named after something like a snake thing, like a sidewinder or something like that. He said shark wheel. It is a dead on perfect set of shark jaws. If you ever see a set of shark jaws, it by God is the exact same shape. And like I told you, it's, some, it's everywhere in nature, it's everything, but it's because it is an exactly perfect set of shark jaws. Okay, the last question. Who does your hair? <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, Zach and David. Uh, us, okay. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a successful spring uh, semester. All right. <laughs>